Beloved, we continue this morning, this Sunday, with the season of Lent. And my remarks this morning are inspired by the devotional the parish has been invited to read this season, Bless the Lent We Actually Have. It's also inspired by a lunch I had this week with a parishioner and by the inaugural Becoming Community Speaker Series entitled Community, Faith, and Racial Justice. So one Lent early in my priestly ministry, I was in a conversation with some folks about what they were giving up for Lent, how they were denying themselves, as it were. And one of them mentioned giving up potato chips and and another chocolate. And others shared things that they were or had given up for Lent. Someone piped in and said, Well, you know, you don't have to give up that on Sundays because they aren't included in the 40-day count. Thank you for the mathematicians, yeah. (laughs) Upon hearing that, I was reminded of a meme that I had seen at the time that was circulating of someone who had given up ice cream for Lent and insisted that Sundays didn't count. Oh, there we go. Sundays, ice cream Sundays. Okay, all right, all right. I'm, I'm, yeah, sorry about that. Anyways, being the pastor in the group and taking it all in, someone finally turned to me and asked what I thought. And I said, probably rather predictably as a young pastor, well, you might not get too concerned with the what of giving something up as whether or not it brings you closer to God and deepens your faith. You know, don't get so stuck in all of the rules that they become an idol. They become your focus. But whatever you do or choose not to do, turn toward God no matter the day. So I share that interaction because there have been sometimes, or maybe even many times, when the church has chosen to emphasize a rule or a custom in a way we often look back and wonder how God had anything to do with it. I want us to take this same awareness into our reading from the gospel passage in Mark this morning. Some Christians have through Mark's passage reduced the message of Christianity to a sort of formula that Jesus must undergo suffering and die and rise again. It was God's plan, and it accomplishes or satisfies the payment for our sins. And therefore, we must take up our cross, die to ourself, and place our only hope in the narrow fate that will be realized at the moment of our death. Now, I don't think this is a straw man argument. I think there's a large sector of the Christian movement that is solely focused on winning a soul for an eternity that happens after death. But eternal life, as I read it, means that there is just as much hope in life before our mortal death as there is after our mortal death, all consummated because we read elsewhere in Mark that the kingdom of a God has indeed come near. And if we read to the end of the story, we'll see that our fate in our mortal, in our life after our mortal death is not off somewhere else, but indeed that God in Christ brings heaven to join with earth. So there are many ways to understand the sacrifice of Christ and his call to take up our cross and follow him. And I'm going to put an asterisk there to stay tuned for our forum on the Sunday leading into Holy Week that Debbie and I are uh, co-leading. So come to, come to that. I can't do all of that in the sermon. But I do want to suggest that taking up our cross has more to do with Jesus' life than with his death. Or that it may have more to do with why Jesus was killed rather than how he was killed. So to do this, I want to reference a New Testament scholar, Ira Brent Driggers, as well as a student of the well-known Jewish writer Elie Wiesel, his student, Rabbi Ariel Berger. 
As Striggers reflects on the early chapters of Mark's gospel, he writes this, quote, Jesus is unflinching in his insistence that the divine mission to welcome and reconcile sinners overrides any stigma of associating with them. I want to say that again. Jesus is unflinching in his insistence that the divine mission to welcome and to reconcile sinners overrides any stigma of associating with them. And Driggers goes on to say that he is also unflinching in his insistence that the divine mission to alleviate human suffering overrides any application of a religious tradition that might impede it. Channeling a long-standing Jewish belief in God's compassion, particularly for the marginalized. So in other words, back to the previous conversation, it isn't about what you give up for Lent, but rather how anything you might do or not do brings you closer to God. And perhaps by extension, here closer or more proximate to the kingdom work that was Jesus' mission in his earthly ministry. Now Driggers makes the observation that especially Peter, but all of the disciples, and perhaps some of us as Christians today, can often become more preoccupied with Jesus' messianic title than with his actual mission. Meaning that Christians can often find affiliation with a rather ambivalent title, comforting, when we retain our idea of what that title means. But for Mark, Driggers writes, discipleship is not some comfortable affiliation with a title Jesus has, but instead is a life-changing and potentially life-threatening commitment to him. Now here it is important to distinguish what is potentially life-threatening and what isn't, right? It helps us to understand why taking up our cross is more about why Jesus was killed than just how he was killed. There is no question among the oppressed peoples of the world that some Christians suffer daily for the simple fact of their faith. We, as a nation, as Christians, should work and pray for the relief of oppressed persons everywhere, especially those harmed for their choice of religion and creed. As Dr. King reminded us, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Fortunately for us, there is no measurable oppression of Christians in America as we remain the dominant and hegemonic power and principality. The fact that Christian hegemony itself is under threat also does not make us oppressed either but rather, beloved, invites us to return to the call of Jesus to take up our cross and in that way die to self. Remember, Jesus did not come to give his disciples power and control in the way that they or we understand those words. That messianic title did not entitle us to the dominant position that was really more about Constantine than anything to do with Jesus' life and ministry. Jesus died, well, precisely because he didn't choose that type of power and control, but rather because those who wielded it figured out that his not choosing that power was much more of a threat to them than his taking up of arms. You see, in not choosing insurrection, in not choosing power and control, Jesus' movement has lasted far longer than any battle or other sort of taking up of arms that he might have mustered among his followers against Rome. So I want to offer a couple of illustrations of taking up one's cross rejecting power and control, of dying to self that come not from our Christian tradition, but actually from Jesus' own Jewish tradition. First, I think a good Lenten 
practice or discipline for us could come from Ariel Berger's recollection of his mentor, Elie Wiesel, offering this teaching. He remembers Wiesel telling him, after surviving the Holocaust and bearing witness to the atrocity of human prejudice and fear of subjugation and dehumanization, Wiesel made this statement. I commit to never let anyone be humiliated in my presence. I want to say that one more time, that a possible Lenten or life spiritual discipline for us could be that we commit to never let anyone be humiliated in our presence. And I don't know about you, but that humbles me which I think is the more proper analog for us as humans. Humility, not humiliation. Another take on this ethic comes from the Bitter Southerner magazine, or e now, who, who wrote in 2017, in these treacherous times, the most important of all the Bitter Southerner axioms is this. Abide no hatred. That phrase originated in their coverage following a neo-Nazi uprising in Charlottesville, Virginia a few years back, you may remember, when they concluded that white faces, faces like mine, have to look straight into the eyes of other white faces and say, I will not abide your hatred. And I might add to that, that the faces that say that also need it said back to them. Of course, there are many ways in which people can be humiliated, right? Just remember sixth grade. (laughs) Perhaps you have been humiliated, or perhaps you witness humiliation. Of course, there are limits to this power, uh, sorry, this practice, limits to this practice. A powerful person cannot be humiliated at the root of their hegemonic position, right? Challenging that power or that privilege is what we simply call justice. Jesus' criticism, in other words, for those who held power, for those who had control, wasn't oppressive of them. It was simply God's justice. So what would it take? What would it mean for you to take up your cross and to abide no hatred? And to whatever extent possible, to live your life in such a way to commit to never letting anyone be humiliated in your presence. Finally, I want to close with a story about dying to self from R.A.L. Berger, who had shared this story in an interview with Krista Tippett in her podcast, On Being. He tells this story. My son was on a trip, a semester-long program in Israel, from which they would travel to different places, and one of them was Poland. And they traveled to there for about 10 days. And on this program, he made a good friend, a new friend named Mason. And when they got to Poland, they were touring some of the centers of Jewish life prior to the Second World War. And they also went to some of the camps. And on about the third or fourth day, of the time in Poland, Mason disappeared for the day with one of the counselors from the program. And he wouldn't tell anyone where he was going, and when he got back, he didn't tell anyone where he had been. And then eventually he told my son, because they were friends, or because my son can be quite persistent. And Mason said this, he said, my grandparents were survivors. They were married three weeks before the deportation to Auschwitz. In Auschwitz, they were separated, obviously. But my grandfather would go every evening to the fence that separated the men's and women's side to bring a piece of bread or an extra potato or even just to see her. Until my grandmother, he said, was transferred to a rabbit farm on the other side of Auschwitz. The Nazis were doing experiments there on rabbits that had to do with finding a cure for typhus. And the rabbit farm was run by a Polish man who 
quickly noticed pretty early on that the rabbits were getting better quality food and attention and care than the Jewish enslaved laborers. And so he started to sneak in food to share with the enslaved laborers and the inmates. And then Mason told my son, he said, my, my grandmother working on this farm cut herself on a piece of barbed wire and the cut became infected and it it wasn't a serious infection if you had antibiotics but of course if you were a Jew in that place and time there was no way you were going to get antibiotics and so what did this Polish man who is running this rabbit farm do Well, he cut his own arm open and he placed his wound on her wound so that he would get the same infection that she had. And he became infected and he went to Nazi supervisors and he said, look, I'm one of your best managers. This rabbit farm and this research is very important to you and if I go down, you'll lose so much of your progress. So they gave him the medicine. And he shared it with the woman, and he saved her life. So Mason said to my son, he said, where was I when I left the other day, when I disappeared? I went to see that Polish man who is still living on the outskirts of Warsaw. And I went to say, thank you for my life. Thank you for my life. So my son told me the story this year, and it raises a lot of questions about what does it take to be the kind of person who will share someone else's wound in spite of all the pressure to see them as less valuable than a rabbit? What does it take to push against all that pressure and do the right thing with courage and moral clarity to see another person as a person, when everything around you is telling you not to. Not just in those extreme situations alone, but how can we turn to the treasures of our traditions, our practices, to become better at this work every day? So, beloved, when we hear Jesus saying to take up our cross, let's remember the whole of his life and ministry. For what will it profit us to gain the whole world and to forfeit our life? Or as the seems to be the case so often in Christian history, to forfeit the life of another. Let us choose this Lent to ask God to bless the lives we actually have. Let us choose the hope of the kingdom come near in this life and not just the life to come. Let us do more than give up potato chips but meet at the fences of separation we have so often erected ourselves not just to give potatoes to the hungry but to start to disassemble them. Let us abide no hatred and not allow the humiliation of anyone in our presence. And let us humble ourselves to share the wounds of those who are oppressed in a way that brings healing for all, both in the everyday opportunities we are given this Lent and in a lifetime of following Jesus to the cross. Amen.